Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank y'all for joining us today. Um, I know y'all all braved the cold and the wind outside. So thanks for um, joining us and hopefully y'all are enjoying the Cadova that we have. So um, today we have two speakers. They're actually um, two of our ITTU mentors here at the Innovation Hub. And so it's Rachel and Doug Deaton. And so the title of our Lunch and Learn today is the Finance Playbook for Entrepreneurs. And so they're going to go over um, the importance of choosing the right advisor, building your board of directors, um, and how to secure and identify um, a board of directors, um, the path to revenue. So good is better than perfect. What is the fastest path to sustainable revenue? and then thoughts on an entrepreneur playbook. And so they are both um, with the Deaton group. And so I will hand it off to them. Hear me? Okay, good. Oh, I do like a microphone. Um, I'm, Ra I'm Rachel of the group and my husband, Doug. And Doug and I were, as we were preparing for this, we were thinking, Doug and I met 33 years ago, our sophomore year here at Texas Tech. And um, we didn't start dating till our last semester of, of college. And we had this class. And if anybody was went to Tech in the 90s or, you know, yeah, it was a business major. We all had to, all the majors had to take this class called ad policy. And um, uh, it was this, we had to do presentations. We had topics we had to talk on, obviously, and then had these presentations. And D Doug and I were in the same group and we had two other people and our presentations were always just like, like they were so goofy and so fun. And it was our last semester and we were just so ready to graduate. So we were just laughing about how much fun we used to have doing those. So we hope that we plan to have a lot of fun up here. So we hope you guys enjoy what we're going to. We hope that you have more fun in that story. <laughs> I know that didn't go as well as it <laughs> Well, look, uh, real pleasure to be here. Um, just so uh, I'm, we're, we're assuming by your presence here, you guys have some kind of interaction with the hub. And it really is cool work that they're doing here. See Adam and. I mean, this is really an amazing place. These, these, so we graduated in 93, like she let out of the bag with her story. So we've spent a lot of changes with Texas Tech since that time. I mean, especially as it relates to business. Um, if these kind of resources were available when, when, I mean, it was just, it's such a different experience. There's no, you know, no innovation hubs, no, very few conversations with, it was just a much different place. So kudos to being involved and just really, you know, proud of our university. Yeah. And using this as a resource. So, you know, and that's, I think that leads way to Doug to like, why don't we share about like what we did, right? So Doug and I did, we met and then we started dating our last semester and then we got married right out of school. And um, then uh, Doug went to work for a medical um, sales company. And then they also did repairs and Doug thought, Hey, I can do this on my own. I know how to do this. So Hence, the first company was started, and we became entrepreneurs. So why don't you share a little bit about that journey and then things that, you know, what we've learned from those so, experiences. Yeah. So, yeah, six months into our uh, yeah, adult life, we started our first company. And unlike most of you, I really didn't even, I'd never written a business plan. I'd never done anything. I mean, I did. I did graduate with a marketing degree from tech, but... I did not, you know, wasn't ready to run a business. So long and short of it, um, we kind of stumbled into um, some success, actually. We we didn't know what we were doing. And nine months after we started the company, we sold it. So I thought, you know, wow, we're actually, we're like real entrepreneurs. And, and we, you know, this is replicable. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> I, we got really lucky. And, you know, the second business we started, you know, by the time when, let's see, we we're only, what, a million debt when we pulled the plug, when I realized that it wouldn't work, when I didn't do some of the things that we're going to talk about today, you know, taking advice and things like that. Um, you know, look, I, I think, you know, as far as business and starting a business, there are, you know, having been, we, we've been successful entrepreneurs, we've had 
you know, uh, we've done every, made every mistake you can make as an entrepreneur in our, in our kind of next iteration of our life, we're financial advisors. And we have a practice now that we've done, we've had for 20 years, majority of our business is made up of, uh, really successful entrepreneurs that have grown large businesses. And so it's interesting looking at our own, the experiences of things that we did right and things that we did just, you know, patently wrong to you look at there's so many similarities with entrepreneurs and and people starting big businesses and the first thing is and i think that this really even trumps this could be the whole thing and it is you're going to fail a lot when you're starting a business or thinking about and and in fact you're going to fail nine out of ten times and it it really is a matter of um you know having the resilience and grit and to to persevere but leads to a, another side point that is really important. And that is knowing when to say when, right? Like you're, you're, you're taking a path, you're building a company, you've got an idea. At what point do you, you know, there, there's resistance to every idea, even great ideas, right? But it, there's a certain point where the resistance is telling you something that it's not a great idea. And so you, you, you know, you, before you spend fortunes and, destroy your life. You gotta, you gotta have an idea of, of when to stick when. Yeah. But that's, and, and to Doug's point that that's why it's so important to surround yourself with good advisors. Yeah. So that's really what we should be talk about. Let's talk about that right now too, about like the, like if, when Doug and I, when we, we you know, when we, when we had that horrible failure of a business, had we had access to something like this, or, so, or and and the right group of advisors around us that wouldn't have happened and we would have we could have turned that company into something successful and that's why it's so important i mean one of the reasons why it's so important to surround yourself with with the right kind of advisors and mentors and so so who are those what are those yeah. So look, um, that is, you know, talking again about people that have been very successful entrepreneurs. If you look at them without, you know, to, to a, all of them all have a tribe of mentors or a tribe of advisors around them. And some of those relationships they've had for decades. And so that really is the importance of you as, as an entrepreneur out, you know, it's, it's surrounding yourself with people that have the kind of knowledge that can, can help you. So, you know, think about from, from any starting, if you were, if you were to ask us, Hey, we want to build a board of directors. Here's our idea. What's the first thing that you would look for? Number one is you want to look for someone that has had success in that first and foremost, someone that's had success as close as possible in the industry that you're trying to create your business. So, you know, computer science, you know, it's someone that has taken up, taken a company public or, or grown to a large company. Um, and they're out there. So that's number one. Number two is someone financial. Um, most entrepreneurs, with the exception of financial businesses, are that typically an area of weakness. And so to surround yourself with someone that can teach you and make sure that you are setting up your business from a financial standpoint properly. So, you know, ex domain expertise, particularly with some exit experience. That's that kind of founder who's done it before financial. And then the, the, you know, I would say you would need a couple of, uh, and these are two, these are kind of interchangeable, but you need some cheerleaders, you know, you need people that are going to, um, you know, pick you up when you fail multiple times, like you're going to do, um, people that really, from an attitude standpoint, have experience and have, but they're really going to be there to, to kind of coach you and, and keep your spirits high um, facing what you're going to face. Yeah. And on the same token, you also need those people that can be honest with you, you know, when you need it and that you, you need to be open to that when there's, when they really need to have that discussion with you and like professional advisors that you really need to be developing relationships with, whether you engage with them or not, but get to know who they are is well, from the get go, first of all, a really good CPA. I mean, they're invaluable. Like you, you need that a tax attorney, uh, m and lawyers, just to develop relationships. And I'm just planting seeds and I don't know where everybody is in their businesses or what they're thinking about or um, uh, trust and estate attorneys. Who am I missing? 
CPAs, financial advisors. Like you need these people. What what business, what entrepreneurs are good at is their craft. And so you, you need to surround yourself with advisors that are good at their craft so you can concentrate on growing your business and what you're and concentrate on what you're good at and then surround yourself with those advisors that they, that's their expertise. So start developing relationships with those kind of people because you really you need that you need that team. Yes. Um yeah, look, I mean it it, it is the, it it's a it's a really important part of your role and of as an entrepreneur and as a steward of a great idea is for you to you know surround yourself with really good people and that should it should be a part of your focus is to go find them and they're and they're out there the thing that's really the thing that I've learned in in dealing with very very successful people particularly business people is how um while they are super busy they to a one will all make time to they're they're more helpful than they're not the problem is most people never ask for help never engage with them and so that's one thing i would challenge all of you is you know there are people here in lubbock or in your uh, in your respective communities that are really successful at what they do or at you know the top of their craft and you would be surprised of if you would ask what they would share with you and developing a relationship I mean, it's I so that... true sorry babe and they have like just here at the just here at the hub like the mentors that you guys have access to here, like there's there's so many people with so many areas of expertise and they'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Or if you need to meet someone, like use these, you like, you know, utilize these people, lean, lean into them, the access that you have here at the hub. But to Doug's point, like, you know, you know, you know, even us, like we would, we, we have conversations with people all the time that don't necessarily become clients because we're happy to share the things that we've learned or the things that we've learned from our clients. I think that might be kind of something fun to talk about too, is maybe some of our clients and some of the, some of the things that, sure you know, that they've, that they've gone through and, and what we've. And, and also look, I, I, let's make this as much as a conversation as well. I mean, you guys, most of you are done eating, so you can speak, but let's make this more of a, a as a conversation as much as possible, you know, happy to share, you know, some insights and things from, so, you know, speaking about our client base, I mean, we've got, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, we've got a couple of tech grads that large logistics companies, um, trucking and logistics companies, and literally we're you know, driving trucks, you know, first they had one truck, then they had two, and then they kept a growth business. And, you know, now they've got a thousand trucks and it's, it, it, it is, um, there's just it, maybe the best thing for you. Like, yeah. What, what, what's important to you guys? There's one point though, before we go to that though, I do want to say this is, this is really important and a common mistake that we've made in one of our businesses. And I've seen people make, and that is, um, this idea of, you know, like having your product or service perfect before you go make, before you get out in the marketplace, you know, it's like, it's, everything's gotta be right. And I, what I want to say is like, it is so important to go get that initial revenue, you know, go out and do your, even if it's not an ideal opportunity, you've got to get, you, you've got to get out and get going because it just, it, it, that's where I see the biggest mistake is where people wait too long to to uh, because the market is going to dictate, you know, whether you're a service, you're you've created a product, whatever. Um, it is the market's going to dictate how, what the price is going to be, the feature set, whether it's a you know product or service, what's going to be most important. The market is so powerful, and you don't that until you get out. And so that's the one thing I would say for all of you is uh, that are you know that are that have companies or initial companies is get out there and don't be afraid to to make mistakes and lose sales and. But to, you don't learn anything until you get out and go. Go ahead. No, please. Yeah. yeah. So as service providers, one thing that we do at the hub is we have, you know, we have tenants and members and startup teams that have experience, good, bad, and the ugly of service providers, attorneys, CPAs, all of this. We get that feedback. We have a list of trusted service that is open to anybody, whether it's yeah. our work in the or not. So feel free to reach out and say, is there anybody in Lubbock that's on your list? 
you don't recommend them. It's not like an endorsement. Yeah. It's just that you have had experience. Yeah. So you do this kind of analysis. Yeah. So that's a good start. And the second thing to your point, I heard someone say, one of our mentors said something to this point about getting out there and not waiting. Is build a plane, fly the plane while you're building it. Yeah. yeah. Like, right on the way down. It's like, true. Yeah. Like, yeah. And if you don't crash, yeah, right. Yeah, go. Yeah, don't be like. Well, and like, our, um, Adam, do you mind if I point you out? And so, <laughs> our, our good friend Adam here, who was is a in, uh, in, in, in the pro, um, and winner of and, the and pitch of the concept, pitch competition, yeah, yeah twenty twenty three. Adam's the perfect example of he's got a manufacturing company, makes a specialty kayak. Um, it's a really cool story. I'll let him. I'll let him tell you about it. But it is um, the one thing I I just think is so much courage is Adam went out and sold a bunch of these, took the concept and sold some on crowdsourcing. Yeah. You know, these, uh, you know, sold his, his product. And that is an, the perfect example of what I'm telling you is like he didn't have a mass produced plan in place, but he did go out and sell some units and and now is fulfilling it. And it's, man, go, I mean, that is really, you know, that's a big part of success. The one thing with, I, I would say with all the successful entrepreneurs that we worked with is they all are relentless, you know, yeah. and they are, uh, you know, and, and I don't mean relentless where they won't take no for an answer, but they just won't quit and they're going to get it right. You know, they're very, very passionate about what they do, but also have the ability to, when someone tells them you, this is why this doesn't work, they can tack and. Yeah. And, you yeah. Know, and our, change. and our clients who are those, those successful entrepreneurs too, they, um, they know their limitations because mostly entrepreneurs are ideas people and they want to be the founder of the company. And some of them know how to run a company. Some of them don't. And the ones that realize what they're really good at and then let other people do what they're really good at. And that's why it's why that's why outside advisors are so important too, because they can help you're, you're, when you're running a business, building a business, you're so in the forest, you can't even see the trees sometimes, right? So all these outside people can help the, the entrepreneurs see that. And, and the most successful entrepreneur clients that we have are the ones that can do that. Have they always been like that? No. But they get to the point where they, they realize what their strengths are and that they do need help. So over, the, over uh, New Year's, we we celebrated with one of our clients, our oldest client, um, our, our longest client. They are actually elderly too, but they are, it was our, we've dealt with them for 20 years. And so this gentleman was, he was a large, he owned a large dealership group of, of uh, large trucks, like Peterbilt dealerships across the country. And this guy has a sophomore education in high school started as a truck driver, first started washing trucks, then drove trucks, then he started selling trucks and he built this business 2005, sold it for $550 million. So after, after net, 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 he made about $210 million after taxes. It's an amazing story, but here's what, here's the part of the story that makes him different is that he went bankrupt five times before he sold it. So how many people would go bankrupt one time and not continue? or two times or three times go bankrupt and still be, you know, and still be married and still have, and you know, it goes five times. But um, so maybe if we give you, if we give an example, cause I, I really am interested in what y'all are doing too. And what, you know, if there's stuff that we can share. So Rachel and I's client base made up. So trucking is a big, uh, is a, is a portion of our clients that have built large distribution, not only distribution, but also they own trucking businesses, logistics businesses. Um, we work with a lot of funds, like um, actually investment management firms, private equity, hedge funds, venture funds. We, we bank the um, founders of these businesses. Um, we deal with a lot of real estate folks, particularly multifamily. So uh, folks that have, you know, just kind of big, what's called value add multifamily. They go buy apartment buildings and, you know, spruce them up and raise the rent and, you know, those kind of things. Um, what am I missing? Some software companies, some folks that have like tech startups that have got, you know, multiple rounds of venture funding. So in, what, what's, what's interesting to you guys? What, what are some things that, or does anybody want to have any specific questions about their business that maybe we can be helpful or point in the right direction on? Please. So the worst scenario has yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's like my biggest fear yeah. is to not only hurt our company, but also to hurt other people's uh, wallets in the process. Like, how can we show them that uh, we're not going to hurt them? And even if, you know, that is a possibility, like, what do we do with that? Yeah. So, look, that's a great question. And so, your obligation is obviously to be as truthful and transparent to an investor as you're supposed to be, right? That's your, I mean, that's the given. But but it's also you all part of that responsibility is you need to make sure that the people that are investing in you, that that is their truly uh, investment capital. You know, you're not taking, you know, life savings from a 85 year old retiree um, as an investment. But look, at, at the end of the day, an investment is, you know, the, their, the risk is that someone that is investing in a private company, the and, and especially of the kind of size that we're all talking about here it is that person should be prepared to lose every dollar because that should be truly speculative. And, and that's another thing too, is, um, you know, when Rachel talked about surrounding yourself with lawyers, you know, there are, or with advisors, uh, lawyers are a really important part of that. And a lawyer is going to put together that operating agreement and partnership agreement between you and your, your investors. And so the, you know, that someone would never be liable for more than they would contribute to a business. So, I mean, I don't know if that's helpful. I mean, and I, I know, and you don't want to lose anybody's money, right? But it's yeah. But it's all part of it, you know. That's like that's people that get into, you know, invested at, at that level, at the angel level, or at the A or B level. We could talk about that too, if you guys want to talk about the different levels of like stages of yeah. entrepreneurship too. He had so, a question too. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if this didn't used to be the case and, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know if this would be number one or number two, but a, at least in the top two, it is um, today it's companies being overfunded or having too much or, or too much credit with now with things where there's been so much credit availability today. I mean, more than there's way more than when Rachel and I started our businesses um, of, of giving you this false sense of security of that, that you can, you have time and that you can be, uh, you, you know, you don't have to be as urgent and as efficient as, as you need to be. So just really mismanagement of capital is, is top there. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, as far as, is failure would be a, not really knowing there's a lot of people that have a good idea a wonderful idea but they really don't know how that idea what is the true value proposition of that idea within the marketplace what does it really bring and so if you really can't answer that it's tough to be successful and so that's the thing i would say is, is people don't do enough market testing before they really you know spend all their capital next thing you know you've got just a you know kind of a vanilla or a you know, off-white color, flat business business value proposition. You know, it's it's. Go ahead. No, but that's what's so good about the hub. Because if you get accepted into to be a business here, I don't know. Do you have a company that's at the hub, or are you thinking of starting one, or just questions? But that's like you can you surround yourself with mentors, and there's a program you have to go to to make sure like that idea is is viable, and like it, the marketplace you know wants it and needs it. And so like when Doug and I were first married as like young 20 year olds starting companies and trying to figure things out, like we didn't have access to something like this. I just think that this, I can't, I can't talk enough about how important an innovation hub is and, and, and to utilize the resources that are here. If you have any inkling of starting a business and how also, you know, how important it is to be extremely vulnerable and, and really coachable and open to other people's opinions and thoughts. And, you know, it's, I've worked with, you know, I, I'm thinking of a, oh gosh, I worked at it before Doug and I started to work together um, as financial advisors. I, I worked with the startup and it was in the art consulting 
world. And this guy had such a fabulous idea. I mean, it was, and it was, and he was selling, he was selling stuff online and it was just a really, um, disruptive idea and it would have been great, but I, and I, and I went to into business development for him and I, sh I remember showing up and he'd already like built this company and hired all these people and created this a massive overhead and to Doug's point had all this major funding and I show up and I'm like, okay, what have you sold? What's been going on? And they're like, well, nothing yet. And I'm like, what? Again, the point of getting to revenue. And I was like, wow, the ship is like going to sink. I mean, literally it's going to sink. So it's, you know, it's, it is, it's, it's, you have to get to revenue. The overfunding can be a problem, but to, to utilize something like this, it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear your take on building a new business um, while you work full time, yeah. and particularly from sort of a venture capital perspective, because it seems like my experience has been most funding sources want you to be in the business full time. Um, they, it seems like they're they're more inclined to invest if you're doing it full time versus working another job. Yeah, and you're you're trying to build this business because you know you've got this revenue source who's helping you build it, but at the same time, the people that can fund you are saying, no, no, you need to be doing this full time. So, so you that's the you know the sixty four thousand dollar question, right? I mean, it's and that's the conundrum. It's the chicken and egg thing, you know. I mean, you uh, somebody doesn't want to back you financially if you're not one thousand percent committed every hour of every day. But then, you know, you, you got to have the wherewithal to be able to do that before you. So it's no, I mean, that is, unfortunately, that is, there's, there's no good answer there. I mean, it is, it's tough. You know, one thing I will say about raising money, um, and we've, because we've done that a lot, is um, the more that you can figure out how to grow and scale your business without taking on someone else's money, the better you are. And 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 that means you know big sacrifices on your part or you know working extra you know working extra hard doing things a little but the more creative you can be because you're you know I, we've gone through a cycle here in the last 15 years or so where there was just so much money out there individually and private you know private equity venture funds that it made it very you know there was just a ton of capital floating around and it made we have a whole class of entrepreneurs that think they need a lot of funding to get things done and it really it's just not the case i mean you especially today, if you think about what, how, I mean, all of us could start a business this afternoon and be selling something online by 5 PM. If we started right now, I mean, that's how, I mean, th that was unheard of 20 years ago. And so the disintermediation of all the things that need to happen for you to start a business has really changed. So the, the more that you can become fanatical about just trying to prove your model, to, you know, if you have an idea, start selling, start, start, doing and figure out how to, how to grow, assuming that you don't get any growth capital. If you can do that and, and you get to a point where you do need growth capital, the value of your business is significantly more valuable. You know, your valuation is higher because you've, you have revenue, you've done things on your own. So anyway, just again, just to reiterate that point that, you know, the, the market's going to tell you the viability of your business. So go out and find it, engage with it, you know, do create, you know, sell. Yeah, true. Save a class, do class, do you mean? Just get out there and- Yeah, I mean, look, I, I yes, it is. It is to get um, so many entrepreneurs, they are waiting for conditions to be right. You know, if it's a software product, we've got this feature set we have to add and these things, it has to be perfect before we go to market. And I would just say that it is, it's a mistake. The people that gain market share, especially from a startup standpoint or new markets are the people that are first to market. And that means they're not necessarily the ones that have, you know, the, the tightest offering it's, it's, they're just there first. And so you don't want to be left behind. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah. Oh, no, hundred percent. No, that that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, and, and I think really from a, the professional advisor standpoint, I think is less important than your kind of board of advisors and board members um, before uh, when you're in this phase. I mean, you don't need to go out and engage lawyers and engage CPA firms and, and you know, it, it, if you, but you do need to go find, you, you want to get some validation from the market with thought leaders and people that have domain experience in your area saying, look, here's a business I'm thinking about starting. Am, am I on the right path? I mean, is this, what do you think? If I was doing this, would you want to be involved? You know, that that's a, those are powerful uh, ways to validate what you're doing without spending a lot of money. But yeah, 100%, you're correct. We did not mean to go out and go engage a bunch of people before you start your business. It does. And, and, and I would even go, I'd even get a little more granular. And I would say, if your business is, if your great idea is predicated on you raising money to do it, it's probably not the best idea because you probably need to either dial it back or it's not like, you don't want to make your hurdle being you have to raise 200 grand to validate the idea. Like you want to be able to validate the idea on your own and then take it because you've made it more valuable. Um, it's that that's a hard hurdle to get yourself in a, in a corner where you need capital to, to produce. I think that you had a question, sir, or did you, did you want to make a comment? Yeah. The people that you get as vendors or investors or advisors or board members, huh? is there a big difference in each one of those categories as to who you can put for to fill those those areas to guide you or board members and things like that? Or are you just buying people that you don't need to buy? No, that's a great question. So I, I think I mean in a perfect world, you want to surround yourself with people that have domain expertise that you don't have. And so that's where I, you know, I gave the example of someone that, you know, you respect their opinion, but real they have a good understanding of financials. Yeah. That's a good board member. Um, someone that has actually been really successful in in the business area that you've had, you know, or that your business is now, that's a good board member. Um, but you do want to have a few of those people too. Like you mentioned, you do want people, I mean, you want everybody in your board to be a huge advocate for you and your business. Um, if they're not, that's not a good board member. Um, but you do need some people that are going to be there where their main role is. They understand the business. They're smart business people, but their biggest thing is that they're just big supporters of you and your idea. Now, investors is a different thing, right? I mean, especially investors is going to be, it, it's a more of a, a business relationship. I mean, they, they're they going to give you their money because they believe you're going to turn it, you know, you're going to create multiples out of it. Um, you know, they're, how you do it, unless they're a really, really strategic investor, you know, they're, they're in that business already or um, they're, it, it's, a, it's a business decision. They, they could, as long as you're not breaking the law, they want you to make money with their money. Um, but no, it, but advisors, that's something totally different. That really is your team that your investors, they're your business partners. And so you're, you know, it, and it, it's, it is a, uh, you know, you, you will, you will develop some, I mean, Rachel and I over the years have developed some really strong real friendships with people that are investors, but it, you know, that didn't start out as that. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, what about confidentiality? Uh, confidentiality. So yeah. I previously many times faced the dilemma that I wanted to ask very intimate, deep questions about the market or the technology of my business, but I didn't know whether I wanted to disclose it, sure. especially because even if you sign an NDA, like how do you enforce it, especially yeah. if you are an early stage company, a startup, don't have the finances to, sure. to litigate. So yeah, if you could uh, discuss. Yeah, that. I mean, look, that that is, uh, I mean, Rachel, neither and I, Rachel and I are lawyers, but 
having been around this a long time, I would tell you that is that is the one area where you have to be really careful for the fact that the, the reason that you just brought up, and that is as an individual without a lot of capital behind you, um, if you share your idea with a bad actor or a corporation, they can steal your idea and you can sue them, but they can probably last a lot longer than you can. And so, you know, sadly, corporate America, most corporations have a litigation slush fund, you know, which is essentially there where they are, they use to take ideas and litigate and the, the calculation you know, they're basically just doing a sensitivity analysis of does it make sense for us to buy this idea or sue for it? So yeah, you have to be very careful. Um, that's one area that I would strongly, if you have a highly technical field or a highly technical idea, that is something worth you spending some money on a really good confidentiality agreement and a process for sharing that info. So that, I mean, and there, I know through the hub, there's some great folks here It is. And that's so hard for an entrepreneur because like all our clients too, who are, who are, have been entrepreneurs, it's such their baby. Like they just can't. And even that art consulting firm I worked for, like he held it so close and he was too scared to go to market. And I'm like, oh my God, this idea would have been so successful, but he couldn't let go. Like it was like, and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. These, these smart Smarty Pants little kids created exactly what he did and they sold it to Christie's for like a gazillion dollars. But he held it so close that he was like, nobody can do this. It's my baby. So he literally talked like that too. Um, but I, you know, and I, I actually just, I want to take some time and just like uh, compliment Adam because we're not proud. We're mentors on his team and we got to watch him do the pitch contest. And one thing about Adam being an entrepreneur, and I hope I don't like embarrass you, but I'm doing it anyway, is he is so open to advice. And like, he's so, he's, he, you know, we feel like as mentors, we can share just about anything with him, the good and the bad. And I remember one call, I think maybe you probably were just like, oh, it was, after, it was when we, Doug and I came to Lubbock and we had beers afterwards. We're like, we'll take him out for some beers. Um, but just that you, you have to be open to hear those things too. And one of the things was, and maybe you can share too, Adam, if you want to about the whole patent thing too, like, do you want to tell that story? Cause I think that would be really relevant for this group. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, really difficult. Getting a patent is a very hard, um, it, a lot of money, um, and so that is, you know, a major part of it is, uh, something, actually, uh, losing this, I don't know. Um, uh, a hub camp that we just had, uh, this yesterday, when was that Tuesday? It's, it's been a whole week. Um, uh, one piece of advice that they had was, um, people who invest professionally, VCs, PEs, um, all of that, uh, you know, their business relies on people trusting them with their ideas. And so if they steal your idea, they're probably not going to be in business very long. Um, so I thought that was really interesting was just, you know, people who rely on people coming to them with ideas, um, for their business to exist, you know, not a big corporation that's in the same field as you and is really a competitor, but, um, someone who might give you money, you can probably feel a little safer going to them, sharing what you have with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the end, uh, the right decision for us, we, we do have a provisional file, but, um, we're, you know, going ahead, moving, getting it out there because, um, it's just, you know, such a high bar to get fully patent protected. And like you were saying, you know, even if you have that protection, 
there's international companies, there's companies that can just out litigate you that can still kind of defeat you, even if you do everything you can to protect yourself. So getting to market quickly and, you know, being a, the name people recognize in the market, I think is, is something that, uh, can help you a lot. Um, and we're hoping to do, we're not to that point yet, but that's kind of something we're working on. He'll get there. Yeah, but we had to pause like, and Adam was really ready to like launch everything and make some stuff. And he had, he had done some crowdfunding and people had bought the thing and, you know, we're lucky that there was a patent attorney on the mentor team and she was like, whoa, we got to pause for just a second, just a second and let's file something. But it shows the initiative that you're, no, this is my idea and I know that it's worth something and I'm going to take care of it. But that's a, that's a great point that they shared at that last camp and, and so true, Tasha. like you can't, you, you got to let it go. You know, and you gotta you gotta trust the people, and that is it's true. The VCs and we know ton. We Doug and I actually live in Austin, and and it's like C Central there. You know, we know a lot of these VCs too. And I'm thinking, like I'm thinking about those guys too. And if someone came to an idea, like and had an idea and came to them, they you know it is it's their responsibility, and to, and that's why they're successful, is because they you know people come to them and they are trusted with their ideas. Their babies. So in the last few minutes here, any, any other questions or anything we can, what you got? Market research. Yeah. Want to take uh, it? Oh, he's asking just about places for market research. But a quick little plug, I know Ryan's going to talk about the end, but we also have an i -Corp program, National Science yeah. Foundation, i -Corp customer discovery program. And that is market research and scope. We teach you how to create a chart, and here it's a five-week program, you start once a week. Um, and we teach you how to talk to potential customers, validation process, not just a pitch. So it's a really interesting way to start to get to see if you're right on time for it. Mm -hmm. But that's your first step in the market. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, you mentioned about employing or surrounding yourselves with CPAs and lawyers, and that's completely understandable because there are very specialty services or 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 skills. Uh, but you mentioned about value proposition yeah. and defining it. Now, that is something where, you know, what I'm asking here is how would you approach someone when you're trying to define your value proposition? Would you invite them to be a co-founder on your company at that point? Or would it be a board member who is being generous with you? I just wanted some advice on how to approach that aspect of things where you're trying to define the value proposition, which is, I feel like the core or the soul of really the idea. So that's a really good question. And I mean, that's, and that's a rabbit hole question. We, I mean, we could go down lots of different, but a really important. So a couple of things, number one is, um, speaking from your perspective only as, or all of you as owners of your businesses, your number one job is, especially if you know, you're going to have a business where you need outside capital, your job is, um, to defend your equity is to keep as much of the company as you can because it's yours. And so, you know, a lot of people forget when they or, or when we, you know, we think about or we talk about raising capital, we think about we're trading percentage of equity. But one thing that people forget and really shrewd deal makers 
don't forget. And that is you have multiple things to trade when you're negotiating with capital, but you have the equity, but you also have the financial interest. And so particularly in companies like software or services where the margins are very high, you have the ability to, instead of trading, I want, I, I have a company that, that I think is worth a million dollars and I want Rachel to invest a half a million dollars. So she would have 50% of the company. Well, if I had a company that had very high margins, instead of me saying, okay, I'm going to split 50, 50 with you. Maybe I convince her that that 500,000 is only worth 10% of the company, but because the service that we're selling is very high margin, I'll trade, I'll give her a piece of the margin. I'll give her a piece of revenue as well. Does that make sense? And so I'm just using that as a really quick illustration of there's lots of levers for you to trade when you're talking about trying to induce someone to come and invest in your company. So there's economic interest, which is what I just you know talked about. And that is sharing revenue. You're not giving away equity, but you're sharing revenue. And then the other is just traditional. You're selling a piece of your business or a piece of your idea. Is that, is that helpful? Or at least, I mean, but you can, that's a very deep, you can go lots of ways with that. That's the art of it, right? Any other questions? Oh, do you have one? Oh, um, yeah. Anybody else? Any questions or anything? Well, real pleasure to get to talk to y'all. I hope this was useful. We kind of jumped around a lot. Um, but this, you know, a, a great place. I'm glad to see all of you here. I'm, I have nothing but really high expectations. And there's so many good things coming out of this building. So keep it up, all of you. Oh, yeah, we're on the website, I think. So feel free. Awesome. Well, let's give them a round of applause. Um, so we um, I've seen a lot of new faces today. So if if you um, are new to our um, events at the hub and you you have an idea, I heard a couple of you all said that you have an idea for a company or you're working on a company um, and you want some help or you want to come to our programs, we would love to talk to you if you would like to. And so I'll be around afterwards or you can just send us an email um, and we can talk to you about different things that we have going on that can help you with starting your company. Um, and so I just have a couple slides for our next programs that we have. So um, our next big program um, that's actually this spring in April is our accelerator program. And so we um, have our accelerator competition where you have opportunity to win $25,000 for your company. And then after you go through the competition, you go through a year program where you get access to our mentors, access to the building, um, and much more. And so if you are interested in applying, there's the QR code. Um, and you can also go to our website and find that. And so the deadline for that application is February 21st. And so definitely reach out to me as well if you have any questions or Tasha. And then our next um, hub camp um, that we have is going to be February 10th. And so we will actually walk through making a business plan. And so we will have some of our more of our mentors from the hub that will actually be teaching that. And so that's our acceleration hub camp. And you can scan that um, and it'll take you to register. And you can find that on our website as well. And then the last thing is just our next lunch and learn. So we loved that y'all hopefully enjoyed today um, and all of the free food that we have. And so our next one for last one of the season is going to be March 8th. And that is going to be 12 to 1 again. 
and we're going to be talking. Um, we have one of our mentors that is with Flint Avenue, and she's a CEO, and it's going to be um, over marketing. So it's called Marketing Madness. And so you can register for that as well, and that should be open um, already. So if you want that, you can. But if you all have any other questions or want to talk to us about um, starting a business, we would, we would love to talk to you. So other than that, thank you for coming.